Welcome to this week's episode of Talking Therapy. Talking Therapy is the companion podcast to my YouTube series, In Therapy. In In Therapy, we follow the brave participants as they go on real life therapeutic journeys with me. This is part of my mission to really break the stigma that we all struggle, we all go through challenging times in our lives. Having strategies, having tools, having support along the way can make all of the difference. And I'm passionate about the fact that we can all create change. Sometimes, though, we just need a helping hand along the way. In this week's podcast, I'm going to be exploring a little bit the theme of sleep. This was one of the things I was talking with Lauren about in this week's episode of In Therapy. I was really struggling with sleep. And I, I got worse and was getting maybe two hours a night's sleep if I was lucky, but really anxious, horrible, trying to sleep, horrible thing. Poor Lottie's never had so many 5 a.m. in the morning walks before. <laughs> in Lauren's episode, Lauren takes a step away from her life, moves to another country to create more space for healing. Is that something we should all be doing? I'm also going to be answering some questions. This is one of the things I really love about this podcast. I get to answer your questions that come up from watching the In Therapy series. I'm going to talk a little bit about how do you balance taking care of your own needs whilst also being there for other people. I'm also going to talk a little bit about goals, self-commitment, and investing in your relationship with yourself. So one of the things that Lauren talked about in this week's episode is the fact that she's been struggling with sleep. And this is often a challenge to people on many different healing paths. Sometimes the irony of living with a fatigue-based condition is one of the antidotes to fatigue is, of course, sleep. But we find ourselves completely tired but wired, not able to switch off and get the quality of sleep and rest that we need. We'll say sometimes when we're going through difficult times emotionally, we find ourselves, our nervous system wired and um, overactivated, and we're unable to relax and to settle and to get the sleep that we need. Sleep's a big topic. and My intention in this session is not to cover all of the different pieces. I'm sure we'll come back to the theme of sleep in other episodes of Talking Therapy. But particularly what I wanted to talk about today is what's happening at night is a reflection of often what's not being dealt with during the day. What I mean by that is if we're having various feelings and emotions that are coming up, but we're avoiding them, we're distracting ourselves away from them, we're using different ways of changing state so we don't have to feel those feelings. The challenge is when it gets quieter, when it's time to sort of turn inwards and relax into a state of sleep, those feelings and those emotions can tend to come up. It's almost like we can't ultimately escape how we feel when it's time to come more closely, be more closely connected to ourselves. And I think there are various tools and strategies that one can use to help sleep, and I'll touch on those in a little bit. But really looking at what are we not facing? What are we not dealing with in our lives, which is coming up for us during the nighttime? By working on those issues that are there the rest of the time, often what we then find is sleep becomes much easier at nighttime. Often when I work with people therapeutically on sleep issues, sometimes they're a little surprised that we're not immediately directly working on sleep because we need to understand what these other issues are. To put it another way, sleep is a natural state. Sleep is a state of surrender and letting go. There's not something you need to do to sleep. There's almost an absence of doing that allows the state of sleep to happen. So what's in the way? What's stopping you from being able to relax and fall asleep? Well, there are some different categories, some different themes that we can look at. The first is, what state is your system in? Is your nervous system just running too fast? 
Have you been spending the day getting wired and triggered and overstimulated in such a way that your system is just running too fast? And it's almost like it needs to get below a certain level for you to be able to relax enough to sleep. And this level's here and you're up here. There's a long way your system needs to calm and settle to reach that point, to cross that threshold where you can surrender and fall asleep. So understanding what's causing your state to be overactivated, what's causing your state to be overstimulated during the day and working on that will help that natural state of sleep happen at night. The second thing is, as I mentioned, what's happening emotionally, what's happening with your feelings. What are the feelings and the emotions that we're avoiding, we're rejecting, we're ignoring? Ultimately, you can't heal what you don't feel. When we don't take care of our feelings and emotions, they don't just disappear. They tend to surface at those times when we're the least distracted and we're the most quiet. So you need to work with your state, calming and retraining your system, to work with your emotions. You also need to work with your physical body. Often sleep issues can be as simple as blood sugar issues, that we're eating too many carbohydrates and not enough proteins during the day. Or we're having our, you know, there's there's a lot of talk these days around intermittent fasting. And it's become a it's sort of become one of the big fads along alongside ketogenic diets of, of the last few years. And I'm sure there are people it works really well for, but there's also a lot of people that it doesn't work well for. I'm one of those people that having a snack before I go to sleep helps me get better quality sleep, which goes against certain wisdom that says you shouldn't go to sleep on a full tummy. I don't sleep well <laughs> without a full tummy. So understanding your body's needs, and if your blood sugar is dropping at three, four o'clock in the morning, your adrenals will kick in and you'll get a hit of adrenaline to raise your blood sugar. And then you'll find that you're wired and you can't sleep. So paying attention to these different factors, the different variables during the day will often then support creating the environment that allows sleep at nighttime to be able to happen. What state are you in? Are you overwired, overstimulated? Where are you at emotionally? And what's going on, what's happening in your physical body. Remember, sleep is a natural state. It's not what do you need to be able to get to sleep. It's what almost you need to take out of the way, which is in the way of you being able to get to sleep. That all said, looking at those different factors and variables of what's happening during the day, there are certain principles and certain routines that can help sleep at night. This is what is technically referred to as sleep hygiene. There are certain things which are not very hygienic, for want of a better word, that will often be unhelpful when it comes to sleep. Some of these things are having too much artificial light in the evening. There's fascinating research on circadian rhythms that shows that when we have too much artificial light, we tend not to produce the levels of melatonin that we need. Melatonin is the sort of sleep hormone. In fact, when people um, cross time zones, one of the effective ways to deal with jet lag is taking melatonin. If you have too much artificial light, you won't produce the level of melatonin you need to sleep. The reason being is if you think back to caveman days, when the sun went down, firstly, the world became more dangerous because there wasn't artificial light. So traveling around often wasn't a good idea. We wanted to stay safe in the cave that we were in. And that darkness was nature's way of telling our body it's time to go to sleep. And our body genetically takes hundreds of thousands of years to adjust. So Edison's invention of the light bulb has only been around for a tiny, minute amount of time in our genetic history. So not having too much artificial light, which unfortunately means if you have sleep issues, not watching screens, not watching television, not watching iPads or whatever devices you're using, ideally for an hour or 90 minutes before it's time to go to sleep. Something else that can work very well is having a hot bath about 90 minutes before you go to bed. Because what happens is the hot bath or you can have a hot shower heats your body and as your body cools afterwards, 
it recreates what we're sort of programmed towards as it becomes cooler that tells your body again it's time to settle and it's time to go to sleep not getting overstimulated not working things that might sort of cause you to have anxiety or cause your kind of mind to get stimulated not having interaction with people that wind you up or irritate you things that you i you might think well if i can't, I can't watch screens and i can't talk to people i can't have light bulbs on what should i do have a hot bath meditate um read a book but be careful not to have too much bright light as you're doing it be close and be loving with people that you love there's lots of ways we can spend that time but we want to train our body to relax that we're encouraging our system to settle to come into that natural place where sleep is a natural byproduct so just to recap what state are you in is your nervous system activated and overstimulated What's happening emotionally, which is not being dealt with, you're not making space for. What's happening with your body in your nutrition. Another point I should make there is some people find exercising too late into the evening doesn't work for them. Others, it works better for them. So understanding how your body responds to certain things. And then look at your sleep hygiene. Look at the habits and the things that you're doing into the evening. And if you're watching this on YouTube, I'd love to hear in the comments, what do you find helps you? What supports your sleep? We're actually filming this podcast um, a week ahead because we're anticipating another lockdown here in the UK. Lauren's episode is actually coming out tomorrow, filming it the day before. But I think a question that people are going to ask is the fact that Lauren has moved to Spain to really carve out the space and the time for her healing to be her number one priority. And is that something that I recommend other people do? And it's a question that often comes up on the healing path that people are struggling to find the time and the space to use their tools to do the things they know they need to do but they're struggling to find the time and space to do them. What if I just took a big step outside of my life and really prioritized my healing? There absolutely is a time and a place. And it really felt for Lauren, this is a good example of what's right for one person at a certain point is not right for another person. It really felt with Lauren that she needed that break with the breakdown of her relationship with the fact that she really was grappling with and struggling with making the time for her healing, that that change in environment would allow her to prioritize in that way. And as you see in the episode, it's really starting to work for her. The best thing that I've done, best decision I've made this year by far. That's great. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so pleased that it's, it's worked out. But there's a caveat here. Everywhere you go, there you are. And it's sometimes very tempting to think, if I just go and live on a beach in a beautiful location without all the problems in my life, then everything in my life is going to be easier. My observation is if we run away from ourselves, we always catch up with ourselves. The same issues in a different location. And sometimes we cause more suffering for ourselves by doing that because we run away from the support that we need. We run away from the chance to work those issues. Like... You can't ultimately work intimate relationship issues fully without being in an intimate relationship. You can work on your relationship with yourself. You can work on the stuff that comes up in relationships. But to fully integrate that, you have to be in a relationship. And when we run away from our life, the danger is we just take all the issues with us, but we run away from the place where we've got the most chance of working those issues. So if you're watching Lauren's episode and you're finding yourself thinking, well, if, you know, it's all very well and good for Lauren because Lauren's able to go off to Spain, I couldn't do that, therefore I'm not going to recover. I want to challenge that and say that isn't my observation. We absolutely can recover from whatever it is we're working on without having the perfect conditions. And yes, sometimes changing our environment can be really helpful, but it is absolutely not a one-size-fits-all approach. So I'm going to come to some questions now. The first question is from Angela. She says, thank you. My question is, how do you find that balance between being me 
and respecting my own needs and being kind to others. I think after growing up in a chaotic home with violence, abuse and neglect, the only way I could feel connected to others was always to to always being kind to putting others needs before my own. My childhood experiences left me with the feeling that I had no voice, wasn't heard, and my feelings weren't validated. I grew up thinking I had to be perfect in all things to give me a sense of control. How do I find any peace and self-love? I feel very stuck. So firstly, Angela, thank you for your question. I think firstly, what I wanna say is this is a really juicy and tricky topic for a lot of people. There aren't, there aren't sort of super simple answers to this. It's like, we need to learn to be there for ourselves. We need to learn to identify our needs, to honor our needs and listen to our needs. But what I'm not advocating, which is something that I see happen sometimes in psychotherapeutic circles, is we become almost super selfish because we're almost in a sort of um, reaction to a helper pattern. It's almost we become a reverse helper that we can't do anything for anyone because we don't want to go back into the old pattern. And ultimately, we want to live in a world where people are being kind and being generous towards others. So figuring out where that balance is, I think, is tricky. And I think often that balance, the, the right balance for that is different at different points in our life. And I sometimes see it like a pendulum. That if that pendulum has been kind of a one extreme, that we've been there for everyone, and then we really start to discover our own feelings and emotions that have not been taken care of, that pendulum sometimes needs to swing to the other extreme. And we go through a chapter, a period of our life, where we really hunker down and we really focus on being there for ourselves. That's okay. And we ultimately want to then come back to find that point of balance. So a few suggestions here. The first thing is you need to know your own needs. To be able to respect and to be there for yourself, you need to know what you need. And often that's a case of processing the times in the past where your needs weren't met. Processing childhood, making sense of, and it sounds like there's been some quite difficult history here. So metabolizing and digesting and processing that and learning to really be there for ourselves. This is one of the themes that particularly we're developing with Katie in In Therapy. And I think, Angela, from what you're describing here, I think you'd get a lot out of following her story. So I hope that will be helpful for you. Um, The next thing is, as you're then looking at connecting to and being there for others, we really want to get clear what is the place from which we're doing that? Are we doing that out of a conditioned response? Are we doing that out of guilt? Are we doing that out of the fact that we think if we're not there for them, they won't love us, or they won't like us, or they won't be there for us? I find it a really helpful exercise for myself, but also when working people therapeutically, is to really, to almost become like a detective like Sherlock Holmes, like really inquire into what happened in certain situations? So let's say, Angela, you had a situation, let's say it's a few weeks after Christmas, that it was Christmas, and someone asked you to kind of go and do something, you weren't feeling up to it, you went anyway, and you felt kind of crappy afterwards, to really take the time to understand what was the motivation? What were you feeling? What was sort of driving the desire to go and do that? It's not what we do. It's the place from which we do it. So being there for others is not inherently necessarily right or wrong, but being there for others because we feel guilty or being there for others because we feel that they won't love us if we don't is very different to being there for others where we feel like we've got enough sort of, we've been there for ourselves and our cup is sort of sort of plentiful and we want to give, we want support. Or being there for others because perhaps that's part of our role. Sometimes being a parent, the last thing we feel like doing is being there for a child that's in a moment of need. But that's our responsibility. But how to do that in a way that's also sustainable and also healthy in terms of taking care of your own needs. So know what your needs are. Process the history in the past. Then really inquire into the why what's driving that experience and what I think you'll find is if you do this a number of times you'll find that there are patterns 
And there's certain patterns of how you tend to find you're feeling the need to be kind and be there for others. The other thing that I always say, when you're working these kinds of issues, give yourself permission to get it wrong. Like sometimes you're going to be like that pendulum I was describing, you're going to swing a bit further than you intended to and you're going to find yourself being a bit ungenerous or a bit unkind towards someone. It's okay. Make make it good afterwards if you need to. There might be some apologies. I often encourage people when they're doing this kind of work to pre-frame it with the people in their lives to sort of warn them that I'm really working on this issue of being there for myself. So if you find that I'm being a bit curt or a bit um, withdrawn, it's not about you. My saying no to you is me learning to say yes to me. Give yourself permission to do that. And the other thing I would say, Angela, is really sit. It's a great question. Like, just hang out in the question. Like, being me and respecting my own needs and being kind for others. The answers often become clearer with questions like this by just hanging out in the question, giving it time, giving it space. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of Talking Therapy. I also want just to let you know that if you're struggling with your goals, it's that point in January where people particularly find that they're not following through on the commitments they've made. Do check out the video I posted on my YouTube channel, How I Stick to Goals. I break down a methodology for goal setting called SMART Goals. I think that could be really helpful at this point in the month. Also to let you know that in the coming weeks, we're going to be opening up registration to my online coaching program, The Reset Program. It's open a few times a year. It's an opportunity to work with me, with a group of people, not just going through some of the ideas we talk about in talking therapy and in therapy, but learning the actual tactics, the strategies, the tools. These are the tools that I'm using behind the scenes with the people that you're seeing in, in therapy. If you're looking to reset your nervous system, particularly working on things like sleep issues, fatigue issues, pain issues, trauma issues, this is my flagship, it's my cornerstone program. The best of what I know is in this program. So if you haven't already, go to alexhoward.com and you can find more details on the Reset program. Thank you for watching and listening. Be kind to yourself. Go gently.